Good morning, everybody. Welcome, and thank you for participating today. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping items that I'd like to review with you. Today's webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted within five to seven business days on our website at greatplainsquin.org. All the lines will be muted throughout the presentation, and you'll see that the chat box is located on the bottom right side of the screen. Please feel free to post any questions you have and we will address them at the end of today's presentation. With that, I'll hand it over to Vicki Palmruder to continue the introductions. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you, everyone, for joining today. As Stacy said, my name is Vicki Palmruder, and I'm a program manager for the Great Plains Quinn in South Dakota. Welcome to Get a Leg Up on Preventing Lower Extremity Amputation. This webinar is presented by the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Quality Innovation Network Quality Improvement Organization for Kansas, Nebraska, North Dakota, and South Dakota. Our mission is to achieve the aims of better health care, improved health, safer care, and lower health care costs. Unrecognized and untreated foot ulcers in patients with diabetes can result in lower extremity amputation, or LEA, which may lead to high mortality, increased medical costs, and reduced quality of life. In fact, Medicare claims data is showing a rising number of LEA procedures. Dr. David Lonbachin specializes in salvaging limbs and will share best practices for ensuring proper foot care to prevent complications. In addition, the webinar will feature a personal story emphasizing the importance of screening and personal foot care. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. David Lonbachin cares for all bone, joint, and muscle health concerns of the feet and ankles and has 27 years experience in diabetic foot surgery. He has a limb salvage program which specializes in treating high-risk wounds and infections at Avera St. Mary's Hospital in Pierre, South Dakota, as well as the Cheyenne River, Crow Creek, and Rosebud Reservations. Lisa Thorpe. BSN, RN, and CDE has over 20 years of nursing experience from critical access hospital and rural health clinic settings, including supervisory roles. She has been cross-trained in a variety of departments and is a certified diabetes educator. So thank you both for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today, and I will now turn the presentation over to Lisa. Thank you, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to this very important webinar. And I would like to share a patient story. And this is JP, who is a 75-year-old white female with long-standing type 2 diabetes. JP has been managed with oral medications, and insulin has been prescribed for her several years ago, but she never really took it as recommended and has been resistant to some other interventions that her primary care provider wanted to try. As a result, her diabetes was poorly controlled with an A1C in double digits for years, as high as 14% at one point, which is consistent with blood sugars over 400 as compared to the ADA recommended range of 80 to 130. So her blood sugars were significantly high. She developed an ulcer on her right foot for which she was referred to podiatry. And about at that point, she stopped going to her PCP because she did not like that he wanted to get more aggressive with managing her diabetes. He told her if they don't change something, she will end up in a nursing home from complications. She saw podiatry for about a year and was reliant on family members to get to those appointments. And one day, as they were walking into the podiatry office, the family member noticed that her left leg looked kind of red. At the end of the appointment, since the podiatrist did not look at both feet as part of the exam, they requested that he look at her left foot. Next slide, please. And this is what her family members saw that prompted the request to check the left foot. I believe this is called xerosis, which is abnormally dry and flaky skin as a result of diabetes. And next slide. And this is what they saw once the sock was removed. JP had been putting band-aids on her foot thinking she had just a little bit of a cut. She did have severely impaired sensation of her foot and poor vision so she couldn't feel it or see it. 
She was directly admitted to the hospital on December 23rd. She had a peripheral vascular surgeon and infectious disease doctor on her team, and they both had a limb salvage philosophy, meaning they try to find a way to save the limb and prevent amputation. The line drawn on her foot was the potential amputation line as discussed by these two doctors. She did have further testing done to check for circulation, which showed that she did not have good circulation and would indeed need to have an amputation of part of her foot. She had the amputation a week later on December 30th. Next slide. This is an updated picture of her left foot for which the amputation was required. She had been has been hospitalized and in rehab since December 23rd, which is now just a week shy of a four month hospital slash rehab stay. Her daughter reports that they are extremely pleased with the care she has received, particularly from the vascular surgeon. Her blood sugars are now controlled. And as you listen today, please consider what could have been done in JP's case to prevent this amputation. Next slide. Um, I do want to take a minute to share some data with you. Um, as a quality innovation network, we have the opportunity to analyze Medicare claims data. And based on Medicare claims, we can see that the incidence of LEAs has been on the rise. Back in 2010, as a nation, as you can see by the blue line, we were at about 61 cases per 100,000 Medicare beneficiaries, and that's now up to 101. Our four-state region is the red line, and we started at 45 cases in 2010, and we are now up to about 82 per 100,000 Medicare beneficiaries. And if you do the math and apply that nationally, we have 38 million Medicare beneficiaries, that would be about 38,000 people who require an amputation per year. And if they all require a three to four month hospital stay, it's pretty significant for lives that are impacted by the amputation itself, a lengthy hospital stay, and then of course the cost of care that's associated with it. Next slide. When we define a lower extremity amputation for this data, we include the number of patients that had a claim with an LEA procedure code and a diagnosis that identifies the patient as having diabetes. The claims that had a code that indicated a traumatic amputation were excluded, and then ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes were selected to match the AHRQ prevention quality indicator number 16. I won't go into that right now. That's a separate talk all on its own. In October of 2015, there was a switch from ICD-9 to ICD-10 classification, which may affect the number of LEAs identified. Next slide. <clears throat> this slide is a little bit cleaner look at the state rates. Um, again, the top blue line is the national trending line. And you can see each state um, did trend upward as well since um, 2010. The South Dakota line is the light blue line, and you can see there was a significant increase from 2015 to 2016, and that may be attributed to um, the updated coding situation. And next slide. And the particular data that I just reviewed is specific to Medicare beneficiaries. But a recently published article in Medscape cited studies that have noted an increase in LEAs and younger age groups as well. One simple um, prevention strategy mentioned in the article is to check the feet. Remember, JP had been doctoring for a year with podiatry for her right foot, and not once had her left foot been checked, even though she should have been identified as at risk. And because checking the feet is so important, I included a reference to a webinar put on by uh, Wound Care Education Institute. And for 10 bucks, you get the CE credit and a very thorough foot care procedure. Next slide. And this is my contact information if you need to reach out to me for anything. And that is all I have. So Dr. Lonbach, and you're up. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's a privilege to uh, be with you today. Uh, I'm a podiatrist at the Vera Medical Group uh, Orthopedics in Pierce, South Dakota. I've been doing this for quite a while now, 27, 28 years. Uh, I have my clinic is located kind of in the middle of Indian country. I've got multiple Indian reservations 
surrounding me within 100 miles, and I have the privilege of going down to three of these different reservations and providing services to try to help eradicate amputations um, on the reservations. Eagle Butte, oh, back in the late 90s, they were having 20-plus leg amputations a year, and the tribe finally hired me to come up there and went up there for three years on a grant, took it down to zero for three years, and not because I'm great, but because we initiated a program that included the nurses, the CHRs, the mid-levels, the docs, et cetera. It's not hard to do. We can make a huge difference with uh, with this patient population. Very few leg amputations are necessary in my humble opinion. I tell my patients that there are three reasons to have a leg amputation. Number one, limb life-threatening sepsis. If the infection is so bad that the patient is going to die or could die, yes, that's one reason to do it. Another reason, terrible pain. If they have ischemic pain that's uncontrolled, uh, that's, uh, that's another reason. The third reason is going to sound a little bit strange, but uh, it's very true. Diabetic wounds take an enormous toll on a person, not only physically but emotionally, and they can go on for years. The last reason is if the patient requests an amputation. Sometimes they want to move on and, and be done. Uh, fortunately, there's not a lot of, of those, but it, it is one. All other ones are usually treatable and usually salvageable with the, with the proper therapy. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Yep, just a second. There's just a slight delay here, so it should oh, I'm sorry. advance. That's okay. These first slides in the presentation are essentially statistics and not necessarily recent ones. We're not going to review those. I just put them in there uh, for you to peruse at your at your leisure. Essentially, it just goes to show you that uh, lower extremity amputation and diabetic wounds is a big deal, uh, not only in the United States but around the around the world. We're making a progress. Um, excuse on me, the... Dr. Lon Bakken. Yep, I'm sorry, my. Um... Whoever my Ventec host person is, can you help me? Um, the my slide isn't advancing. And yes, this is you, Emily. Can you make? Okay, um, Vicky, can you help me out? Can you make Vicky the presenter and have her advance the slide for me? Sure. Apologize for this little technical glitch. Okay, Vicky has the ball now. Okay. Okay. Vicky, can do you can you advance for me? I am not seeing Just push this the space bar. You just have to push the space bar. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. Awesome. Okay. Thank so you, you can go ahead Thank and you. scroll through these, uh, Vicky. Uh, again, you can review these at your leisure, but uh, it's a uh, it's a big it's a big deal. And in my opinion, the reason it's a big deal is because of our carbohydrate uh, society. Uh, even in my hometown, it's just you know that that's just what we eat, and then that's what's creating all the diabetes and subsequently all the problems. The fact was alluded to earlier that the problem is getting worse and not better, yet I'm working very hard and, and we're getting better and better at this. Why is it getting worse? Well, the problem is, is that the care is getting better. And if the care is getting better, these diabetics who used to not have very long lifestyles or very long life lifespans are now having longer lifespans, and they're realizing the end-stage effects of, die, of renal failure, uh, peripheral angiopathy, et cetera, et cetera. And we are seeing the gangrene, uh, the vascular paths who aren't salvageable because there's nothing to bypass, 
etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Go ahead and advance the slides until you get to the unholy triad slide, please. Keep going. Should be getting there pretty soon. Here we go. Uh, I'm a spaghetti western Clint Eastwood fan, so subsequently the title of the Unholy Triad. And with diabetes, what that includes is peripheral vascular disease, peripheral neuropathy, and immunopathy. The uh, picture you're looking at is uh, just as a simple uh, diabetic foot infection, and you can see the fear elevator sticking through the foot. That just shows you the sinus. That's pus draining out the top of the, the foot. This is from a soft corn between the fourth and fifth toes. Uh, that's a relatively dangerous wound that can spread very quickly. Go ahead and advance the slide, please. Peripheral vascular disease uh, is when people have high blood sugars, the inner lining of the arteries begins to thicken, and over the course of, of years, that provides some pretty significant occlusion to uh, our, our arteries. Combine that with nicotine from cigarette smoking, and we have uh, we have some big issues. I tell my diabetic patients who smoke, I say, I'm really not too concerned about your lungs, et cetera, et cetera, but I will guarantee you an amputation if you're a diabetic and you continue to smoke. Nicotine is going to constrict those small vessels, and it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of, uh, of when. And peripheral vascular screenings are relatively easy to do for mid-levels, doctors, nurses, um, CHRs. I've, I've got all kinds of people doing these for me uh, out and about. Next slide, please. Things that we look for, dorsalis pedis pulses, posterior tibial pulses. I look at the overall appearance of the skin, you know. Is it dry? You know, is it purple? Is it red? Is it white? Is it warm? Is it cold? Is there hair growth on the foot? If there's hair growth on the foot, there's usually adequate circulation. We'll blanch the end of the toe and see how fast that color comes back, usually three seconds or less, and, and we're good. Uh, elevational pallor, dependent ruber. Uh, the first slide that you saw of the xerotic leg with the redness there, could that be cellulitis? Absolutely. And some, some people get fooled by that. I have a lot of people come in with red legs, and they'd say, Doc, I've been on antibiotic for three months. It's still red. I lay them on their back. I raise their leg up 45 degrees, and within 30 seconds, the leg turns white. And I have to say, well, unfortunately, you don't have an infection. You have vasculitis. Infection doesn't go away with elevation. Otherwise, I hang all my patients upside down and let them, let them uh, drain the infection that way. But these slides, uh, the pictures here, that's dry gangrene on the top left. Uh, amputation afterwards on the uh, right, multiple toe amputations on the on the bottom slides. Next slide, please. If we want to get more specific, uh, handheld Dopplers are very helpful. I use them almost every day. If I can't feel a pulse because of vascular insufficiency, swelling, uh, the handheld Doppler. If I hear a you know pulsatile pulse with that, I'm usually pretty comfortable that they're going to be okay. Segmental arterial Dopplers are another tool that I use. I'm not a fan of, of ankle brachial indices, primarily because most of my patients have calf calcified arteries. You're going to get elevated ABIs, so I'd rather use arterial Dopplers. And we'll put cuffs you know, below the groin, above the knee, below the knee. And, and at the ankle, and we look for changes in flow because what I'm trying to find out is where is the occlusion. If I have pressure below the groin at 180 and I have pressure 120 above the knee, well, then I know that I have occlusion in the thigh region, and that's probably going to be amenable to angioplasty and stenting. If the pressures are consistent all the way down, I know I'm probably looking at small vessel disease. If I find patients that are able to 
uh, you know, have bypass or have, you know, angioplasty and stenting or refer them on to vascular surgeons. I do not have the privilege of having vascular surgeons where I live at, but uh, I, I will use them. It is interesting that uh, there's just been a recent uh, study about uh, just exercising a simple walking program, and they're they're finding out that walking programs, graduated walking programs, where patients just start walking and walking more and more, are showing to be very effective in improving patients' circulation. I don't usually get angiograms because there's no sense for me to fry their kidneys uh, when I'm not the one who's going to be doing the the bypass. The picture on this slide is actually the head of the proximal phalanx of the bone sticking out of the foot, and that's not an uncommon thing that I see. Uh, it's very common to have bones exposed. I was up in our wound care center about an hour ago, and I had a lady with an ulcer in the front of her ankle and her bone sticking out. So that'll be my project for next week. Next slide, please. Peripheral neuropathy. Now, there are multiple forms of neuropathy. There's the peripheral neuropathy where we have lack of sensation. This is a toothpick I pulled out of a person's foot many years ago. Toothpicks are terrible. I hate them. I'd rather take out a needle or something I can at least see on x-ray. But uh, when people don't have sensation, they can get things in their shoes and in their feet. I had a patient many years ago that had a broken toe. Uh, from down on uh, one of our Indian reservations, and I took an x-ray of the foot, and lo and behold, there were 30 hypodermic needles in this patient's foot, and I thought to myself, well, this can't be right. It must be an artifact on the x-ray. So a month went by, and the patient came back. I took another x-ray, and lo and behold, there's those 30 needles again. Come to find out that the patient was, a, was a, you know an insulin-dependent diabetic, and her old nurse used to tell her that after she gave herself an insulin injection, she used to break off the needle. Well, the needles would go into her shag carpet, and so she would walk around the shag carpet not feeling anything and ended up with a foot full of needles. And I left them in there. One of them actually got infected, and I did have to take that one out, but she had an A1C of about 15 or 16, so I didn't want to get too aggressive uh, with her. The other type of sensory neuropathy would be the burning type sensation that we're all familiar with, the, the painful neuropathy. The hallmark is this neuropathy is usually worse at bedtime. That's how you can usually discern that. One of the things that I really have found enormous success with is uh, an over-the-counter medication called alpha-lipoic acid. If uh, you treat peripheral neuropathy, uh, it's over-the-counter, it's dirt cheap, and it's 600 milligrams once a day, uh, twice a day, and in bad cases of neuropathy, I've just been amazed at how effective it is. And you can buy it at Walmart, Walgreens, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Before I put people on gabapentin or Lyrica or some Bolt or anything like that, I usually give them a month or two worth of alpha-lipoic acid first. And uh, weekly, I have patients coming in to me saying, wow, doc, this is a miracle. How come nobody ever told me about this before? So very happy that, uh, that I have been able to use that on these uh, poor patients. Autonomic neuropathy is just a type of neuropathy that, you know, makes you sweat above the waist and dries the bone below the waist. It also creates a lot of these foot deformities from tendon and muscle imbalances like bunions and hammer toes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the motor neuropathy uh, does that. Next slide, please. Nobody really knows exactly what causes peripheral neuropathy. There are many... Uh, theories uh, regarding it. I don't know if anybody's really put a, a handle on it uh, quite yet. We uh, we do have uh, tools. Next slide, please. I'm not a big fan of uh, nerve conduction studies for diabetic neuropathy. It really costs money. It really doesn't tell me more than what I can find out with a simple, you know, SEMS wire and uh, and a tuning fork. Now, when the when the SEMS wire first came out, it was, oh, it's a miracle. You know, this little instrument is going to get rid of all these leg amputations. Well, obviously that didn't quite happen. 
And when you when you evaluate a person for neuropathy, the first thing you should probably try is a tuning fork. And when a patient comes and sees me, I, I have them hold out the top of their hand. I hit them with a tuning fork, and I say, you feel this? And they say, yep. And I do the same thing on their foot, and I say, do you feel it the same or the less? The first sensation that diabetics lose is vibration. And then we'll move on to the SEMS wire and see if they can feel that or not. If they can feel the SEMS, the thing about the SEMS wire is that it's how you it's how you do the test that standardizes it. You approach the foot with the wire, the wire hits the foot, the wire bends, and then you retract at the same speed. That standardizes it. You can't grind it into the foot. Say feel this, feel this, that that doesn't that doesn't work. But if a person cannot feel a 5.07 SEMS wire, it means they've lost protective threshold. And that means if they have a coronary or a callus, that they're in all likelihood going to develop a neurotrophic ulcer from that. So it didn't work out for preventing all these amputations. It is a good tool. It came from the leper colonies. That's how they, they discovered it down in Carville, Louisiana. But what does it tell us? If I if I put a if I put a SEMS on a person and they can't feel it, that tells me that the patient cannot protect themselves. They don't have enough sensation to do that, and that tells me that, that patient is a candidate for number one regular diabetic foot exams by whoever can do them accurately. But it's also a person that's a prime candidate for uh, diabetic shoes because you know consider the diabetic shoe a tank. And hopefully our brave soldiers in tanks are protected, and that's what we want to do to the feet. They can't protect themselves with the threshold, so we do it by getting them diabetic shoes. Diabetic shoes of old are the Herman Munster shoes, the Frankenstein shoes. Fortunately now there's lots of other shoes, Dr. Comfort, uh, uh, many other ones that are actually lightweight, very good shoes, and uh, well, they'll, they'll sell the shoes in pharmacies, some podiatrists do. Uh, find somebody that uh, does does a good job and and don't be afraid to to utilize them. There's a reason the Medicare pays for them. The uh, nerve conduction studies, like I said, I'm not a big fan. It doesn't tell me a whole lot more than what I know with a simple test. Uh, nerve biopsy, not not in my practice. Next slide, please. Immunopathy uh, is just the body's uh, decreased ability to fight off infection. You'll, you, that's why it's important to know what the person's A1C is. Uh, a simple infection that anybody can fight off, even with good circulation, somebody with an A1C of 14, they're going to have problems. And something that you wouldn't normally put anybody on, you know, Keflex or anything, they can, they can go south very, very quickly. Uh, high blood sugar levels impede uh, chemotaxis of the white blood cells. So the white blood cells essentially are normally able to find and sniff out the infections. Well, the, when the blood is sweet, they lose that ability, and it might take a while to mount that uh, that response. So handle with care uh, people who don't have very well-controlled uh, blood sugars. And again, the hemoglobin A1C is a, and we like to have our, our patients see their regular doctor every three days for an A1C, and they, they'll come and see me based upon what we consider their, their risk level. Uh, next slide, please. So when I'm looking at whether I'm going to operate on somebody, there, there, are, there are things I, I obviously look at. One of them is glycemic control. You know, I, I like to optimize, but in, I don't live in a perfect world, and I know you don't either. Um, sometimes I, I have to take them to the OR, if they, even if they have high uh, A1Cs. You, you have to do what you have to do. Uh, I always want to make sure that I've got, you know, circulation. And uh, there are other there are pharmacological treatments for bad circulation, uh, Trental, Platol, some of uh, those. I'm always interested in kidney function. I want to know what my, uh, what my serum proteins are. If, uh, if your serum albumin is less than 2.5, uh, that's going to be a, that's going to be a hard wound to heal. Not impossible, but it's going to be more difficult. And most of our diabetic patients have kidney failure or kidney, you know, loss of function to some degree. So the kidneys normally filter the good stuff and keep it in our body, such as protein, and, you know, urinate out the stuff that we don't want. But when our kidneys aren't working, sometimes we leak that, leak that protein. And uh, when we leak that protein, uh, we get hypoalbuminemia, 
and uh, the wounds just don't uh, don't like to heal. Regarding uh, regarding wound care, uh, there are some very specific uh, wound care protocols I follow. Number one, we we need to have necrotic tissue removed. I was just telling a patient this morning uh, that you know from South Dakota, he has it from rural states. I I tell him. Well, you know, this wound has dead tissue in it. That's like a farmer's field. If the farmer's field is full of rocks, they're not going to grow a very good crop on it. We're going to have to pick those rocks out of there, and then we're going to be able to have a good crop. Same thing with wounds. you got to pick the rocks out. you got to get the dead tissue out of there. Uh, we also want to have appropriate antibiosis. We want, the, we want the germs out of there. Wounds are like babies. You know, is a, is a, is a baby going to do well? In a blizzard? No. Is a baby going to do well in a desert? No. They need a very specific wound in their environment. Wounds are the same. They, they need a neutral pH and they need a, they need a, they need moisture in there. So these are the, when I look at wound care products, et cetera, et cetera, those are the, those are some of the things that, that I look for. Next slide, please. Uh, antibiotic therapy. This is this is one where sometimes we we have to think a little bit more. It's very common. I, I'm a referral center for a lot of ERs around here, and a lot of times the patient will come into the ER in one of the outreach areas, and the doctor will you know give him a shot of rocephin and a slap on the shoulder and say, okay, we're gonna send you down to pier. And it's please don't do that unless you're going to treat that infection locally. If if it's going to require incision and drainage or debridement debridement of bone infection, osteomyelitis, leave them off antibiotics. Antibiotic therapy prior to cultures of surgical culture will alter cultures. I've seen it for years, and in some cases it's been uh, pretty pretty impressive. Uh, regarding antibiotic therapy, you know, I, I like deep cultures, but sometimes I have to I take what I can get. You know, if if I need to put them in the hospital and I can't operate until the next morning, we'll take we'll take cultures in the ER. I'll take them again in the OR when I have deep ones of bone, et cetera. Make sure that they all match up. Our laboratory, when uh, when Avera took over, we changed everything to quantify the number of bacteria in our cultures, one through four. Uh, zero, no growth, one probably contaminant, plus two growth or something, three growth is a lot, four growth, you're overwhelmed. That way I know if I'm dealing with a contaminant or a, a true, you know, infection. Diabetic infections are almost always polymicrobial. It's very rare to you see one bacteria in a diabetic foot infection, usually a gram positive, a gram negative, sometimes an anaerobe. So when you're, you know, prescribing antibiotics, Keep that uh, in mind. If patients have fever, we will get blood cultures, obviously. Hospitalized patients, we'll usually start them on broad spectrum antibiotics, usually zosin and vancomycin. Why vancomycin? Because I see a lot of MRSA. And, uh, we just, until we get our final cultures back, then we'll then we'll change it appropriately, but, uh, otherwise we hit them, hit them pretty hard. And the MRSAs, the VREs, the anaerobes, don't forget about those. They can sneak up and, and bite us. Most elective surgeries we prophylax with ANCEF, and ANCEF doesn't kill any of that stuff. So uh, I'll get burned every now and then with a, with a MRSA that I wasn't expecting. Next slide, please. What's new and exciting in, in our world? Well, what you're seeing in the slide is a, is a tissue expander. I use a lot of tissue expanders. Uh, large wounds with large deficits where I remove bones, I'll pull them together with these tissue expanders and I can take wounds that would normally take six months or longer to heal and I'll have them healed up in two to four weeks. Uh, so some really neat stuff out there. Uh, I'm a big fan of platelet-rich plasma. I've used it for well over 10 years now. Uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, not only do I use it in tendons and uh, sports medicine, but I use it for wounds. Uh, the only difference is in wounds, I will uh, mix thrombin with it. Thrombin is like putting a match to gasoline with the platelets. That really fires them up, and uh, we heal large voids very, very quickly. Uh, amniotic stem cells, I also use uh, a lot of those. I use them more as a filler than as a cover. I'm not a big, uh, I'm not a big graft fan. I don't, uh, I'll do some of it, but uh, when I have large voids from removing uh, bones, 
uh, metatarsals, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I'll fill the voids with uh, amniotic stem cells. Uh, the powder I like to use is uh, Amniofix. It uh, looks like sawdust, but I, I call it magic fairy dust. I put it in there and uh, uh, really have enormous success with it. I uh, used to use a lot of antibiotic beads. They've kind of fallen out of favor. In the old days, I'd uh, mix vancomycin with uh, bone cement beads and uh, thread them with a Keith needle like I, like I do with my kids at Christmas or popcorn around the Christmas tree. Uh, they have beads now that absorb in the body. The problem with them is that when they when they resorb, they like to drain. So if you're going to use the antibiotic beads, just be prepared for the for the drainage. Uh, ultrasonic debriders are are wonderful. Uh, those critters uh, vibrate, I think, 22,000 vibrations per second. Wonderful for cleaning out uh, wounds. Of course, wound vacuums have not been around for a long uh, time. I, uh, I use wound vacuums. Um, I don't use them as much as I use the tissue expanders and the amniotic stem cells, uh, but they certainly have a very valid role in, uh, in limb salvage, and uh, uh, people that use them uh, are usually very, very good at them. Skin substitute grafts, uh, I use a few of them. Uh, they're awful expensive. Uh, wounds will fill in and come together. Just remember that wound care, you know, Patience is a virtue, and that goes with that goes with wounds. There, there is usually not a magic bullet. Set your patient's expectations uh, realistic, and, and you'll you'll have a lot happier patients. Uh, next slide, please. Osteomyelitis, bone infection. That's uh, one of my main things that I, I deal with. A general rule of thumb is say if you can touch the bone to an opening in the skin, the bone is probably infected. A little bit of uh, you know, controversy regarding that, but I've done this for 27 years, and it's been my experience that if I can touch the bone through the skin, that we usually need to go in and remove that bone. My, I'm old school. I believe that infected bone must be surgically removed. There could be some controversy with that because there is full-blown osteomyelitis, and there's another thing called osteitis, and osteitis is more of a inflammatory condition that mimics osteomyelitis where it hasn't quite penetrated the cortex yet. I have seen that cure in IV antibiotics, but if the cortex is interrupted, it's going to need to be removed, in my humble opinion. And then please note that opinions are like noses. Everybody's got one. Uh, this webinar today is my opinions uh, based upon on my experience. Um, I'm, I'm always I'm always learning things, always trying to learn things, and uh, as we should all. Again, I'm old school. If I have uh, positive bone cultures and pathology, usually I go with six weeks of IV antibiotic, ther antibiotic therapy through a PICC line. Uh, sometimes, you know, Zyvox, linazolid, there are some orals that I, I will use, but you have to look at every individual patient. Some of my patients live way out in the country, live on reservations. Coming in for uh, IV antibiotics three times a day is not realistic. Uh, sometimes some of my infectious disease doctors don't quite understand where I live at, uh, so sometimes I have to make a polite phone call to explain the individual situations. Uh, where I come from, uh, having running water and uh, toilets and heat is not necessarily a given, so we have to treat these people like family and do what we do for the ones that we love. Uh, pick lines, porter cast, PO are, are obviously the, the modalities we administer antibiotics through. Be careful regarding MRIs and osteomyelitis. Uh, MRIs are only as good as the people who are reading them, and uh, not everybody reads them the same. Uh, Charcot feet, uh, different types of feet will kind of mimic some of the signs that osteomyelitis does. So, you know, if you have an MRI that shows widespread osteomyelitis through the midfoot and the hindfoot, but the ulcers underneath the second metatarsal head, you can probably guess that the MRI is a false positive. So you just have to, you know, have to look at all the information in front of you and, and make decisions based upon that. And as I said, combination of x-rays, clinical judgment is, are, are the best options. It's, a, it's not always a science. It, it, sometimes it seems to be more of an art. Uh, next slide, please. We talked about the amputation uh, before, you know, the, the, the three reasons why. Uh, that's just a, a synopsis of that. 
um, this one uh, on the on the right uh, did end up going to a leg amputation. There is just just nothing nothing to salvage. Uh, next slide. All right, please make a stop. It just keeps getting worse and worse, and uh, and we're we're doing as much as we as we can. But like I said, diabetes is out of control. It's a carbohydrate society. Uh, when we eat processed carbohydrates, our body produces lots of insulin. When we produce lots of insulin, our body becomes immune to it, and therefore we get type 2 diabetes. I tell my Native American patients, and, and it is a privilege to work on the reservations. I love the people. I love the culture. And I will tell them that diabetes was not seen on the reservations before processed food. And I said, so... To make it, I'm a kiss guy, keep it simple, stupid. And one of the things I tell them is that pretend that you can eat, and we could probably all learn this lesson, only eat what your great, great, great grandpa ate. Could he eat a steak? Sure he could. Could he eat a chicken? Sure he could. Could he have tomato? Sure he could. Could he have tea? Sure he could. Could he have a can of Coke? No, he could not. Could he have a hostess Twinkie? No, he could not. Could he order Chinese takeout? No, he could not. If we can get our patients to, you know, eat like that, you know, 80% of the time, we're going to make a big dent in this. I, I just, again, I'm, I'm a kiss mentality, but of course, you know, we have, we all have to to pitch in and try to educate, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, smoking is a no-no. Uh, the, the nicotine is the devil. Watch those A1Cs. Exercise is a big deal. If uh, I run a mile and you walk a mile, we burn the same amount of calories. Cardiovascular-wise, I might be getting a little bit more benefit, but you don't have to run marathons to, to be in better shape. Proper footwear and, and foot exams, uh, that's a big deal. Try to get these patients into, you know, podiatrist, local provider, whoever is willing to take the time, the, the nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, whoever. Look at the patient's shoes. Again, proper footwear where I come from is not a given. The, some some of these poor people just have some, some terrible shoes. When we started getting diabetic shoes for some of the uh, Indian Reservation people, as the time went by, the problems got less and less to now where we don't have a whole lot of issues anymore. You know, one pops up every now and then, but, you know, that it's, it's not what it used to be, that's for sure. Next slide, please. Uh, different types of ulcers, uh, neurotrophic ulcers, ischemic ulcers, stasis ulcers. Next slide. Okay, the top left is a rattlesnake bite. A poor young lady was going out to her garden and got zapped by a prairie rattler and Depreted that. That was easy. That was healed in a couple of weeks. It's a simple uh, thing. It's about Panafil, um, the Santil now, I guess it is. Uh, but that uh, that was necrotic ulcer from the uh, from the snake venom. The uh, ulcer on the heel. Those are those are ischemic ulcers. Now you look at the heel ulcer. Heel ulcers are terrible. Uh, and sometimes you get false security because they, they look black, they look harmless, they look scabbed over. But in my practice, there's two types of scabs I tell my patients. There's good scab and there's bad scab. And if I cut that scab off and know that there's red tissue underneath it, that's good scab, then I'm fine with it. But until I see that red tissue underneath it, it's bad scab, and it needs to come off just so we know what we're dealing with. Otherwise, it'll tunnel down to the calcaneus. And, and I can fix calcaneal osteomyelitis, but it's not a fun pleasure. It's not a pleasurable experience for myself or the patient. Uh, the bottom right is a uh, ulcer at the end of the toe from a hammer toe. You know, the toe is curled down. The end of that toe, bang, bang, bang on the on the ground. Uh, I usually just take a numb up that toe in the office, stab the bottom of the toe, cut that flexor tendon. The toe straightens out. Ulcer is gone in five days. Very simple. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I was going to go over the ulcers a little bit more. The thing about ulcers is the, the stasis ulcers are, you know, on the on the lower legs usually. Remember, an ounce prevention is worth a pound of cure. Stasis ulcers do not happen if the skin doesn't dry out. So when you have, so when you're taking care of these people, make sure you use a good uh, uh, skin emollient. I like uh, I like urea creams. Uh, Aveeno is a wonderful product. Cerive, uh, my wife's a big fan of that. Uh, lots of good ones on the market, but keep those, keep those legs moist. And remember, stasis ulcers, a big part of that is the change in the pH from all that swelling down there. So 
you know, I can I can roll my boat across the Missouri River in the, with a hole in the bottom, and I can get across the river if I bail water. But when I get across the river, I still got a hole in my you know rowboat. And the same thing applies to to these ulcers. You can use all these fancy wound care agents, but if you don't get that swelling out of there with diuretics or compression therapy of some nature, you're making it a lot harder on yourself. And regarding the neurotrophic ulcers, these are the pressure ulcers on the bottom of the metatarsal heads. These are pressure ulcers, and and you have to offload those bones. Now, I usually do that surgically. That's that's my experience. Is that you know there, there are two schools of thought on this, and and there's no right answer and there's no wrong answer. But I, I give my patients a choice. If I have an ulceration, submetatarsal head three, because that third metatarsal head is sticking down <clears throat> too far, I'll tell the patient, now we can offload this in total contact cast or a cam walker or wheelchair or crutches and we can debride and we can use local wound care and when we get it all healed in six months or longer, if we are lucky, you're still going to have a third metatarsal that is sticking down too far and the possibility of that ulcer coming back again does exist. So we're going to need to have you into a diabetic shoe or some offloading footwear. Or, I, if they're a candidate, I may go in surgically, break that metatarsal head, raise it up, and put a small screw through it, and now they don't have a bone sticking down anymore, and that ulcer is gone forever. So, some, you know, the, the jury's out. You know, it works well in my hands uh, as far as, you know, doing prophylactic surgery. I've done it for many, many years, uh, well over 25, and... Uh, but uh, it's uh, it, there's no right or wrong answer. I just have to explain these things to our patients, and uh, and everybody is different. Everybody uh, deserves our our respect and uh, and uh, to be taken care of individually. Now, uh, wound care again: eradicate infections, debris, devitalize tissue, pH neutral environment. Brings up the question: Some people like to soak wounds. Okay, and you now is that a good or bad thing? Well. In my in my humble opinion, you, you sit in the bathtub or the hot tub too long, and your hands are all you look like you're you're 90 years old. You're all wrinkled up because that water is is dilute compared to the water in your body, so it's going to desiccate the body. I give I, I challenge anybody to come up with a soaking solution that's pH neutral. We're trying to get cells to grow, not kill them. So Epsom salt water, dilute iodine, stuff like that. That's a no-no in my in my practice. Now, if you have you know necrotic tissue, plus you want to use a whirlpool debridement, I mean, I guess I'm not going to argue with that. But I, I'm usually not a fan of that. Want a moist wound wound environment? Nutrition is important. You know, you have to make sure these people um, uh, have have good nutrition. All my patients, I always tell every one of my diabetic patients, buy the book called The Glycemic Index and um, and, and learn how to eat properly. And it'll, it'll change their lives. It's an easy read. It's a cheap book. Many wound care protocols and products are on the market. Uh, most of them work. A lot of them are expensive. And uh, we don't want to nickel and dime our patients uh, to death. That's not uh, how, how we treat each other. So, you know, I, I'm very simple. Uh, I like uh, I like collagenase, which is Santos, Nenzan debriding ointment. I like Amerigel. Though those are the those are two my two mainstays. Uh, you know, there's the alginates. There, there's all kinds of markets. Um, and I've used horse pericardium. I've used fish skin. Everything. Uh, and like I say, it doesn't keep it doesn't always take a can to kill a mosquito. Uh, sometimes the simple things work work very well. It just it just takes patience, and people have to understand that. Next slide, please. Uh, prevention. That's wet gangrene in this slide. This is a this is a young teacher. Had this for a couple of months. She about died. I did end up having to do a four foot amputation on her, but I flapped a skinner on her. We actually saved about two thirds of her foot, and then she uh, ended up uh, going somewhere else and ended up losing her other leg. So uh, you help who you can, I guess. Prevention: diabetic shoes and and socks. Uh, I'm a, I'm a fan of them. Uh, just remember, if the shoe is not attractive. The uh, patient is not going to be excited to wear it. If they don't wear it, they're probably not going to get the benefit from it. 
off-road racing for charcoal feet uh, and things like that. There are some uh, pretty amazing things that we can do with off-loading braces, gauntlets, AFOs, etc. We briefly discussed prophylactic surgery. I'm a big fan of that. Regular foot exams, you know, just the, the repetitiveness of telling people the same thing over and over again. You know, my wife has to tell me things over and over again before I get them. Uh, my patients aren't a whole lot different, but uh, the, the repetitive nature of explaining these things to patients, don't under, underestimate the value of it. And routine foot care, you know, trimming corns and calluses, trimming toenails uh, is, uh, you know, one morning I might be doing some big salvage procedure, in the afternoon I'm trimming toenails. Trimming toenails is not the most glamorous part of my day, but it's something that needs to be done. I'm 54 and I have trouble cutting my own, so I'm going to be a terrible old man. So, you know, I have my diabetic patients come in every three months. I trim their corns and calluses, their, their toenails, I'll get them shoes once a year if they qualify under Medicare care guidelines. And uh, and we make sure that, that we educate them on, on diet, on seeing their regular doctor every three months. And then patients are happy for the service and uh, kind of kill tumors with one stone in that regard. Next slide, please. Oh, that's my, that's my little princess Lola. So uh, the presentation is over. I'm uh, more than happy to take any uh, questions. This subject is uh, is very extensive and very complicated. I can talk for days on it. Um, again, these are my insights. Uh, everybody does things differently. I'm not saying I'm right. Um, I, I have success doing what I do, but uh, I always keep my eyes and my ears open and uh, and I say, and I strongly suggest that you know take the take the best of what you see incorporate into your incorporate in your protocols and things you don't agree with you, you don't have to do. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you for your time. It was a privilege to uh, be with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lon Bakken. Um, just a reminder for those of you who have questions, you can submit them in the chat box and we'll address them at this time. We do have a, a few questions already, and one was specifically talking about CHRs. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the role of other staff, like uh, they can play in the foot, foot care and the exams um, to prevent people from needing to be referred for further, further <coughs> help? Absolutely. Well, hopefully we want to try to direct our patients to a primary care provider, whether it be a mid-level uh, or a doctor, to, to do the A1C every three months. That That's comprehensive care. Hopefully the mid-level or the you know, the doctor uh, is is doing a foot exam. Some places have podiatrists, some some don't. A lot of nurses go out into the community, and and I give lots of in-services uh, to our CHRs on the reservations, uh, to home health nurses, et cetera, et cetera. And and I'll have one of the gals or guys take off a sock and shoe, and I'll I'll, I'll show them how to do a foot exam. I can do a foot exam in a, in a minute, and 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 do everything. And so it's not. Not a hard thing to do, and it's not a hard thing uh, to to learn. But you know, the the person, the, the patient doesn't stop at the ankle. You know, there's a there's a there's a brain, there's a heart, there's 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 a, there's a lot of things you have to consider. So you look at the patient as a whole. What's their situation? What's their living situation? Et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you know, not just you know the the foot, but nutrition. Are you getting meals? Are you uh, you know, are you being taken care of, or your mental status, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the CHRs, uh, I have the utmost respect for the ones that are out in the trenches doing that, and uh, and some of them are very well trained. I train when I can. Uh, if you're, you know, out there, and if you have a, somebody who's willing to come out and show you how to do one, um, you know, most podiatrists, you know, I would think would be willing to come and put on, a, on an in-service. I don't charge anything for it. I mean, it's about helping our fellow man. Um, and so you can, you know, hopefully you can find somebody that's willing to, to teach that. But, uh, yeah, just a simple test of the overall appearance of the foot. You know, look at the, the skin texture, temperature, the uh, pulses if you can feel them, and, uh, and the cursory, uh, Test. The ones who are going to run into trouble are the people that have corns and calluses. The people with corns and calluses are the ones who are going to eventually ulcerate. They're the ones that need to be referred on. Other ones, you know, just give them the guidance, you know, that you can regarding, you know, 
nutrition, regarding, you know, the A1Cs, et cetera, et cetera. Can I answer that to your satisfaction? I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a request. Can you go through your list of the products that you utilize that you find to be most effective? We had a couple of people who were asking um, to have you repeat that list. Sure. For uh, for skin emollients, I like the urea creams, U-R-E-A creams, caramels one. Urea creams come in either 10%, 20%, I believe those are over the counter, and 40% is is for the hardcore people that have the really bad, you know, calluses. Uh, that's a prescription. Uh, and again, I like the, the Vino Baby Lotion with Oatmeal is one of the best creations God ever uh, gave us. I, I love that stuff. And uh I have my I have my elderly people use that. Regarding wound care, uh, there's a there's a product called Amerigel, A M E R I G E L. It's over the counter, it's not very expensive, and uh, it's uh, it works uh, amazing. I had a patient, uh, a guy gave me some samples of it out in San San Diego. And wanted to use it for ingrown toenails, and I had a lady that I've been dealing with an ischemic wound on for about six months, and it wasn't working well for the toenails. And I said, "Hey, why don't you try this?" Two weeks later, it was completely healed up, and I was like, "Oh my goodness!" And I, that got my attention, so I started using it more and more. And it's just a rock solid product; uh, works very, very well. The other thing, the other one that's a really good product are the enzyme debridding ointments. Panafil was the old one that went off the market. Now it's called Santil, S-A-N-T-Y-L. It's an enzyme debridding ointment. It's a little more expensive, uh, but no matter how good a job we do debriding a wound surgically, we're not going to get it all. So when I do a surgical debridement, drain pus, et cetera, et cetera, after I'm done, I'll fill the wound up with packing that I usually mix with this enzyme debriding ointment. It looks like kind of Vaseline uh, with a better smell. And then that dissolves any dead tissue that I missed. Next day, I pull it out. I reapply it. After a couple of days, I've got a clean wound. I go back in there, do my final bone work, put amniotic stem cells, and I close it up with either suture or with a, with a tissue expander. But the sand pill is, a, is another wonderful uh, product. There, there are so many products out there that, you know, just look at the, the basics and that story I told you about a baby is, 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 and again, it's the KISS mentality that Dr. Lonbachen uses, but so important. We're trying to, we're, we have little babies we're trying to nurture in these wounds. Don't soak them. Don't put betadine on them. You know, give them a neutral pH. Give them, get rid of any infection. Um, you know, that that's how you heal wounds. I mean, it's a very, it's a kindergarten mentality, but I've done this for 27 years. It's the right one. And, again, there are all kinds of, of things out there. And, and some of them, and, again, most of them work. I, I'm not arguing that point. But uh, the the issue is a lot more expensive. And, and many of the people I deal with just can't afford it. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, tried, I've, I've tried a lot of different stuff. And, and the, the simple things work quite well. Uh, some people who don't have any money, I'll give them free samples of silvadine cream. I've, I've, you know, that, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, Neosporin, uh, those things are fine. One thing I will say about the, the wound things that you put on is that, you know, do you want to cover your baby's head with a blanket? You know, suffocate them. Same thing with wounds. Wounds need to breathe. So be very leery of using ointments on wounds. Uh, wounds uh, are occluded by ointments and they fester. So, so we really, uh, we really want to uh, avoid ointments on, on wounds, especially ones that drain because they, if, if it can't go to the surface, it's going to go the other way. They're going to start to tunnel. So uh, creams are, are much more uh, reasonable in my practice. I rarely use ointments. As a matter of fact, I, I do not use ointments. Sandhill is the only one, and then that's an enzyme debrider. Those are those are the ones that I primarily use. I I do like the amniotic stem cells. I I use quite a though quite a few of those, and I I do like platelet rich plasma. I had somebody ask a clarifying question, wondering if the alpha lipoid I don't know how you say that the lipoic, acid if that's okay for kidney failure. 
Lipoic, there you go. Uh, yeah, alpha, uh, ALPHA, lipoic, L-I-P-O-I-C, and then acid. Uh, you know, it's it's over the counter. I, I, I I'm not smart enough to know that answer, uh, but I usually tell people to start off with 600 milligrams once a day and take it with food or without food. And people that have neuropathy, uh, I have a friend. He's younger than 50 years old. Um, has neuropathy from uncontrolled diabetes and probably a few other issues. Uh, his pain was at a 10 out of a 10, and he tried all the other things. And uh, I, I put him on this, and uh, he did 600 milligrams twice a day. And a couple months later, I did some other work on him, and he said, hey, by the way, I wanted to tell you that uh, that my pain I was having is now, uh, is now down to a 1. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's awesome. And then I really started using it after that. But uh, I give it to you, know, to, you know, use the bottles.